which uh, Ralph Greenberg right here is going to teach um, will probably be more about more analytic aspects, but we'll see. It could be, but it'll probably be more um, things related to L functions, zeta functions, uh, etc. And the third part will be class field theory. So, this course into Maybe zeta and L functions. Our representations, that sort of thing. And then three class field theory. And um, I'll be primarily teaching this course. I'll teach all the uh, two weeks of it. So, um, and Ralph will primarily teach the second one. And then Trevor Arnold who is uh, the Vigor postdoc in number theory, and was a student at Chris Skinner at Michigan, will teach most of the third part. He'll also teach two weeks of this course. And I'll teach two weeks of this course. So, no more details about what this course is about. Um, by the way, welcome to University of Washington for the people who are new here. Um, number theory, just to say a few words, so the number theorists who are uh, faculty members here are me, Ralph, Neil Koblitz, and uh, Trevor is a postdoc who will be here for the rest of this year. And we hope to hire somebody maybe um, at the assistant professor level this year. So if you know of any promising candidates for a tenure check job in number theory, definitely let me know because we might try to recruit them. Uh, so there'll be more number theory people. If you're considering um, becoming a number theorist, there are not too many students in number theory. There are actually three total shared among the three people who could advise students. So I have one student, Robert, right here. Uh, Ralph has one student, Koopa, who's probably in Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, Neil Kovitz has Dustin, who's right here. So these are the three people who are officially number theorists. Um, so there's plenty of an opportunity for more students to become number theorists. I mean, Ralph could have you know, three students. I could have five students. So, um, don't think that we're completely full. Uh, seminars, there's a number three seminar, which I think will be meeting Tuesdays at four. Uh, most times. Uh, sometimes there are faculty meetings at the same time, so we'll be meeting at five o'clock um, during those Tuesdays. And there's a website for this, which you can get quickly from my homepage, or you can just go to wiki.wstein.org slash ntuw for number 30 at UW. Uh, I'm also putting together a computational number theory and cryptography seminar. which it looks likely that it hasn't been scheduled yet, but it looks very likely it will be meeting on Wednesdays at um, probably 4 o'clock. That seemed to work the best for various cryptographically inclined people. So probably Wednesdays at 4. And another seminar which isn't directly related to number theory is the SAGE seminar, which will be meeting Mondays at 5 p.m. And the webpage for that is um, wiki, 
Actually, just go to my homepage and it's easy to find. So, my homepage is wstein.org. It's pretty easy to remember. If you go there, you'll find this quickly, since it's one of the first things. Uh, the course website is uh, should be listed on the syllabus. Yeah, so it's uh, under course webpage at the beginning of the syllabus. It's wiki w stein work a and t zero seven for algebra algebraic number three, two thousand seven. And um, as the URL suggests, it's actually a wiki, so um, anybody here could log in and change things on the website for this course. And uh, you just have to create an account for yourself. So if you want to, you know, post some things that other students might want to look at or something, that's a way to do it. Um, don't change the syllabus. That would be kind of, <laughs> you could change the homework to 5% of the grade or something, but um, wikis are nice because you can easily see what changes were made and who made them and then revert them. So don't do that. Um, there's a mailing list that everyone who was officially registered for the course will be subscribed to. If you're not subscribed to it, you can subscribe yourself. The mailing list address, it's a Google group, is listed right here. So it's uw-581s. Also, have office hours two days a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 3 p.m. And if that, if you really need to see me outside of those times, just um, make an appointment. So as far as the actual content of the course goes, um, it's going to be a mix of a lot of theory and a lot of computation. So probably about a little more heavy on the theory than the computation. So. But definitely the emphasis is on theory in this course. And um, this course itself, I've taught it twice before, though um, both previous times it was to undergraduates, but they were the very best undergrads at Harvard. So maybe they're similar in background to some of you. Um, so I taught it twice, and the, the main goal in the course is always the following. To prove the following two theorems, I can't really state them yet for you, but prove it's called finiteness of class groups. And um, prove Dirichlet's unit theorem. So these are the two main theorems, and one of the goals of the course is to give complete proofs of those two theorems. And the sense in which the course will be more towards theory rather than computation is I'll prove finiteness of class groups, and then at the end, after giving a complete proof of that, I'll say some words about how you can compute class groups in practice, but I won't go into any serious detail about how to do it really efficiently. Whereas one could easily teach a whole course, which is just about how to compute class groups quickly. So that's a definitely, it's really going to be the computation as always sort of an afterthought in that, yeah, you could compute this, here's some explicit examples, here's what you do. But that's not really the central focus. Um, so our goal mainly is going to be to prove these two things, but there's a ton of other things along the way that we'll do, um, many of which I've listed in the syllabus. So we'll do some basic commutative algebra, um, we'll talk about through some basic facts about Dedekind domains. Actually, Trevor will next week. Um, I'll talk, I'll do more than just prove finiteness of class groups. I'll define them, talk about how class groups make sense, and talk about theorems about class groups and so on. Um, I'll talk about decomposition groups, inertia groups, ramification. I'll give a basic introduction to Galois representations. And then I'll do some topics near the end where I'll make statements without proof about um, zeta functions and the class number formula. Uh, local fields, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the Riemann hypothesis, the generalized Riemann hypothesis, the Artman conjecture, and so on. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, those, there are a lot of topics. The main topics are these two. Uh, the prerequisites that you need really aren't that bad. Um, so I've, I've listed him here, basically. You need to have some basic familiarity with finite groups. Um, hopefully you've seen the structure theorem for finitely generated abelian groups before, but I will go over that um, briefly at the beginning. Um, commutative rings, ideals, and quotients. Almost all the algebra will do will be commutative algebra where the ring has dimension, or is it, or is a number field or a finite field. So it's pretty. 
It's sort of the easiest commuter of algebra. Um, elementary number theory is nice for examples. And uh, definitely it will be good if you've seen Galois theory before, though you don't have to you know, know the proofs in Galois theory by heart, but you should have some familiarity with number fields. And a little bit of point set topology. Okay, so any questions about the content of the course before I move on? Okay. Um, homework, so there's going to be homework. It'll be assigned every Wednesday due the following Wednesday. Because I won't be here next Wednesday, it'll be due not this following Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. So if you look on the homework assignment that I handed out, you'll notice that the due date um, is October 10th rather than October 3rd. It's just because I won't be here. Um, so what will happen with the homework is, uh, first it's 40% of your grade. What I'm going to do is you'll um, hand it in on Wednesday, and then I'll redistribute it randomly. And then you're going to grade some random other person's homework, which will give you a sense of what a readable solution really is. Because if you read somebody else's solution and you can't make sense of it, then you'll understand what you know, it takes to actually write something that's understandable. So you'll grade them, and then hand them in on Friday. And then I'll take them and I'll grade them. So I'll look over everybody's homework. I can change the grades that you got from the other person arbitrarily however I want, but it will give me some guideline. So for example, if they put zero, I'll definitely look really closely at that particular problem to see what you know, they think you did wrong. Um, and then I'll hand back the homework on Monday. So it's due on Wednesdays, not on Fridays. It's due on Wednesdays. It's assigned on Wednesdays. And you'll get feedback both from me and from one random person in the room. It'll probably be a different person every time, so at some point, every almost everybody else in the room will have looked at your homework. Yes. Is your executioner hooded, or do you know who they are? <laughs> <laughs> they, you know who they are. In fact, their name will be put on there. Um, and it, the point is really just to give you practice with reading solutions that aren't so clear, because it gives you a much better sense of what you need to do in order to write solutions that are clear. That's the, the first thing. And the second um, thing is you see a wide range of different ways of trying to write things up, which will be helpful. I think it's a really good exercise just in understanding what you know, the basic assumptions are in writing a proof in this area to have a look at other people's arguments. And again, if they you know if they they grade you very or if you grade somebody very badly, I'm going to see it and I'll fix that. So it's not uh, really bad. Um, it's just supposed to be something beneficial to everybody. The main problem from your point of view is you have to spend more time because you have to read through somebody else's assignment. So it's this much extra work um, for this class. But as you can see, maybe from the first assignment, the, assi the homework assignments usually aren't that long, and they won't be ridiculously long ever, um, from my point of view at least. Professors always say that, so trust me. Um, exams, there'll be exactly one exam. It will be take home, and it'll um, be given to you on November 2nd and due on November 5th. So you have the weekend to do it. So um, if anybody has trouble with those dates, let me know right now. It's not a religious holiday or anything else to check. Okay. Um, if you find out that you do, email me soon. Since it's a take-home exam, it's pretty flexible how, it, how it's given. And there'll be no final exam, but there'll be a final project, which will be worth um, the other 30% of your grade. And a good time to start thinking about your final project is right now. Um, you know, if, you, if you know a little bit about algebraic number theory or a lot, think about something you might do. Um, one example might be uh, Come up with a toy implementation of the general number field set. That could be a project. Another project might be um, to do something with primality proving um, the Agrawal something algorithm, AKS algorithm. Um, there's tons and tons of possible projects that you could do. What's how do we? Is that just like a written paper that we turn into you? Or yeah, is it? it's a written paper or a piece of code that you write. Um, one or the other. And um, each time I've taught this course in the past, it's had projects like this. So you can look at maybe 20 or 30 examples from the last few times I've taught it. Um, the course website for this course has uh, links to the previous times I taught the course. So you can see there the sort of thing that I'm looking for. And there's, there's really an amazing range of projects that you can do that are related to this class. But yeah, you, might as, you can start as early as you want on that. Okay, next, if you flip over the syllabus, you'll find on the other side that I've attempted the impossible, which is to see into the future and see exactly what we're going to do every day. Now, um, that's really hard, and it's possible the schedule could slip or something, but I will try to stick to this as closely as I can. Um, so, 
I'm not sure, I don't really want to read this, but just, just to make you aware, um, this is roughly what we're going to do. It's, I think a pretty, I mean, I thought about this actually quite a lot, and revised it many times, I think this is pretty much what we're going to go through. The um, nice thing about this is that you could take the course textbook, which is linked to you from the course website. You could um, read everything that's related to all these sections. Almost everything here has a section or a chapter in the course textbook. And you could be way ahead of the game. You could just you know, spend a weekend and just read most of this stuff. Um, since you know exactly where the course is going. And um, if you're going to miss a day, you know what's going to happen. Um, also, if you're concerned that we're not doing enough or we're going to do too much, you can already let me know because you see exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, so that's the syllabus. Let's see. Uh, one thing about the textbook is that um, the computational parts of the textbook I will update a lot. Um, I've only really rewritten the first two or three chapters as of right now. The theoretical parts of the textbook are pretty much how they're going to be. So if you download and print some part of the book, um, keep that in mind. So um, frequently there are examples in the book that involve Harry or Magma. They will be replaced by examples that involve Sage. And that's the main change. And there will be a lot more examples than are currently in the book that are of a computational flavor. But um, the theoretical part, I mean, I've gone through it twice before. Um, last time I taught this course, the students got extra credit on the midterm for finding any typos or mistakes in the theoretical part. So they found a lot. So I don't really want to change it very much, because these students really assiduously um, I tried to find any any small mistake. So the book, the, the sort of examples and computations will change, but not the theory very much. There's a little bit in the um, plan that isn't in the book, but very little. Okay. All right. So I think that's everything regarding the technical details. Any questions about organization of the course or? Anything we need to know? Okay. So now I'll start with the course. Oh. So my plan for um, what to talk about today, uh, first is just to try to answer the question, what is algebraic number theory? And um, second, depending on whether I have time, I'll start. I'll say something about finally generated abelian groups. Something that a lot of people here may have already seen, but it's kind of a, a good thing to, to get on the right track. So um, I once asked Robert Coleman what algebraic number theory is when I was taking basically the same course but at Berkeley um, 10 years ago. And he said it's the study of the Gallo group of Q bar over Q. choice of algebraic closure of Q. It's a, a field that contains the rational numbers and is algebraically closed. And it's as small as, as small as you can get. Now that you join all things like square root of 2 and so on to the rationals, then gal Q bar over Q is the group of um, continuous automorphisms of Q bar. But um, this description I find very unsatisfactory personally because um, I don't know, I think more of algebraic number theory as being um, a whole bunch of theorems and problems that people try really hard to attack, and uh, this is a little too sage-like for me. So, um, speaking of sage, by the way, um, this is the software I'll use for a lot of examples, um, so you might want to take a look at it. You just go to that website, sagemath.org, and here's an example of using Sage to make um, an, a number field. So an example's input to Sage is k dot angle brackets a equals number field x squared plus one. This makes the number field that's generated by root of this quadratic polynomial. And then 
we can now do various things with k. If you type k dot and then hit the tab key, you'll see maybe a hundred different commands that uh, give you access to various functionality related to k. For example, class group, Galois group, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, that was a quick aside. So what is algebraic number theory? Um, so in uh, Galois theory, where you study general fields, one of the special types of fields that come up a lot, which of course motivated Galois, are number fields. And in a sense, Gal um, algebraic number theory is a study of a huge constellation of objects that are attached to a given number field. So a number field is, one definition is it's a finite extension of the rational numbers. It's an extension as a field. So it's a field that contains the rational numbers that's finite dimensional as a vector space over the rational numbers the degree k over q is finite. If you think about it, if you have any field at all, and it contains the rational numbers, and you can view that field just taking its additive structure as a vector space over the rationals. And a uh, number of fields just have such a thing so that the degree is finite. This is the degree. And um, one of the nice theorems you prove in a course in field theory is that any such field can be generated by a single element, the primitive element theorem. So this k is in fact equal to q to join a single number alpha, where this alpha has to be a root of a polynomial. So f of alpha equals zero, where f of x is a polynomial with rational coefficients. So that's what a number field is. It's what you get, if you like, by taking um, a polynomial with rational coefficients, considering a root of that polynomial, and then adjoining it to the rational numbers, you get a finite extension of Q. And the interesting thing is you can associate a huge constellation of objects to a number field. And it's these objects that we're going to, going to study. So you have a number field K. Here it is, it's Q adjoint alpha, which just means the um, set of all polynomials G of alpha, where G is in Q of X, and say the degree of G is less than the degree of this field. Um, so one thing you can associate to it is something called the ring of integers, OK, which is a ring that's contained in the number field. And it's defined in a very simple way, but the funny thing about the definition is it's not at all clear that, the, that this OK is even a ring. That's one of the things that will be proved next week. It's a set of all elements uh, beta in the number field so that beta satisfies a monic uh, polynomial with integer coefficients. So such that H of beta equals zero for some beta in Zx uh, monic. So some, some monic polynomial. <coughs> the leading coefficient is one. Wait, I guess H is polynomial. Oh, did I reuse H? No, you said H. Oh, whoops, thank you. Thank you. So H in Zx monic. So it's, not, it's by no means clear that if you take two, in fact, it's kind of hard to prove that if you take two um, numbers, beta and beta prime, that both satisfy a monic polynomial with integer coefficients, it's not at all obvious their sum or their product will have the same property. That will be proved next week. Um, but you have a ring now that's associated any number field. Computing this ring actually is a very hard problem in general. Um, the problem is, well, you could just take the ring, if say alpha has this property, you could take the ring Z adjoint alpha. Uh, 
um, you can always sort of rescale alpha so, it's, so it satisfies this property, it'll be contained in OK. And then you have to enlarge it to get something that's equal to OK by adding in a few extra things. And that can be very, very difficult. Um, it turns out that the only thing that's difficult about enlarging this ring to be OK is figuring out what prime, what are the possible primes that divide this index. Once you know a prime divides the index, it's pretty trivial to find to kind of get rid of p in the index to find some order that's sitting here or some ring that's sitting here that's containing OK and bigger than z alpha. Um, the problem is, in order to find the primes that divide this index, what you do is you compute the discriminant of this ring. We'll define that later. The discriminant of this. Well, you actually, don't. You compute the discriminant of this. You know the discriminant of this differs by squares. So what you do is you factor the discriminant of this and look at the primes that divide the discriminant, or at least whose square divides the discriminant, and those are the primes which you have to enlarge. The only thing that's hard in the whole algorithm is factoring the discriminant. That's what's necessary to go from here to here. So already, just computing this seems to be a very difficult problem in general, if k has a large degree, just because it, it just boils down to factoring. So um, you might wonder, if you've ever wondered why is factoring so important to mathematicians or number theorists, it's not just because factoring integers allows you to crack crypto systems. It's also because um, as soon as you start doing any non-trivial algebraic number theory type calculations, one of the first steps you end up having to do is to compute this thing, or at least try to avoid it. But once you start trying to compute this, you end up having to factor. So um, number theorists uh, benefit a lot from the fact that so many people care about factoring. And we would really, really love to be able to factor integers very quickly because it would make computation with number fields and their associated objects very quick. OK, so or this one of the key things would be much quicker. So this OK, there's another thing attached to it called the class group. This is a ring. It's what's actually called a Dedekind domain. It's um, a dimension one ring. One example of this, by the way, is k equal to q, the rational numbers. And then this OK is just z. That's one example. Another example is k equal to q join i to Gaussian integers. And then OK, so anybody know what that is? I'm oh, sorry, Gaussian rationals. Or just, <laughs> the Gaussian integers, z join i. Um, so another, you, you can take this ring and then consider all the ideals in this ring that are non-zero and um, define an equivalence relation on them where, uh, well, we're, where you say that two ideals are equivalent if one times the inverse of the other, I haven't defined the inverse of an ideal, is a principal ideal. What you get is what's called the class group of OK. So it's another object that's attached to K. Class group. And this class group, which is the group of ideals modulo principal ideals in OK, it's something very similar to the card group or the divisor class group of a curve, which you might have seen from geometry, but in the context of number theory, um, this class group is something that people are also extremely interested in computing, in fact, well, and also in understanding. So it's a finite group. It's a finite abelian group. And um, it can be computed. There are really slow algorithms and really fast algorithms. One interesting thing is that in practice, if you assume um, the Riemann hypothesis or generalizations of the Riemann hypothesis called, appropriately enough, the generalized Riemann hypothesis, um, then you can compute this group vastly faster than if you don't assume the Riemann hypothesis is true. So the difference is often something like 50 seconds versus 0.1 seconds. That's the sort of difference you notice in you know, real life. So. Um, in practical, everyday mathematics, people often like to actually assume the Riemann hypothesis is true because it makes it possible to do tons of calculations that would just take way too long to do otherwise, or at least they're way too impatient. So this can, in practice, I mean, of course it depends a lot on the degree, but it's pretty quick to compute if you know, if you assume the Riemann hypothesis and really, really slow otherwise. So it would be really nice if somebody would prove the Riemann hypothesis from the point of view of computational liberty. 
Because then all your calculations would be provably correct and way faster. And so everything involves class groups. And most serious um, calculations in algebraic number three boil down to computing the class group. So algebraic number theory, it's about number fields, rings of integers, class groups. And there's actually, I mean, there's more structure. There's more and more structure the, the closer you look. So, um, well, step back for a moment. I mean, there's, so, there's kind of so many different directions you can go in. So one very exciting direction to go in when you study algebraic number theory is you could start with um, a number field such as the rational numbers, and then um, consider a number field K where it's a Galois extension with, say, Galois group with cyclic of order P. Um, so I'll denote that by cyclic of order P. And you could keep, keep doing this, make another Galois extension where the Galois group is cyclic of order P. You can keep climbing up like this and make an infinite tower in some very natural way of um, abelian cyclic of order P extensions of the rational numbers. One way of doing this is just adjoining all p roots of unity to q. You get a huge field, and then there's a subfield of index p minus 1 inside of that huge field that forms a tower like this. And to each of these ki's, you can associate this class group. And then you can wonder, is there any way to understand what happens to these class groups as you go up farther and farther and farther and farther? And uh, Iwasawa theory tells you a lot about that. Well, maybe you want to say something, since you know all about Iwasawa theory. Well, one interesting question is, um, um, in this example, um, we don't know if these groups are non-trivial. Oh, well, maybe they're a four to one. For every prime p? I believe that we don't know an example. <laughs> Contradicts that. This is a very famous question for people, too. Mm -hmm. The question of um, the 19th century. And the calculations have been done up to um, degree 32, I think, or something like that. And the class group is, is trivial. There you are. So, <laughs> so that's an unsolved question. It's, it's actually very bizarre, though, that, that sort of problem. Here's a really innocent sounding question. So I've defined, I've roughly, I haven't really defined it, but I've told you there's a finite abelian group attached to any number field, which you get by taking ideals mod principal ideals in this ring of integers. So uh, Ralph says an interesting open question is whether these are all just the trivial group. Yeah, okay. um, oh, that's yes. for your specific tower. Yes, if you so that's it, specific it, it can yeah. be non-trivial. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so here's an um, even more innocuous question. Are there infinitely many number fields that have trivial class group? So, open problem. Are there infinitely many k? The, this class group I just defined, well, sketch the definition of um, trivial. And we don't know the answer to that question with proof? It's obviously yes. In fact, if you take real quadratic fields, q joining the square root of a positive square free number, then very often you see that the class group is trivial when you compute it. But um, nobody's ever proved that there are infinitely many k for which the class group is trivial at all. Weird. Um, very strange. So uh, algebraic number theory is definitely a an area with a lot of basic open questions still that are very difficult. Um, as an area of mathematics, it's really um, something that started with Fermat's last theorem in the 1600s. Um, but really, I think it started its development. I mean, some people might say algebraic number theory is um, 
the result of trying to prove Fermat's last theorem. It started with attempts to prove it, and fortunately it didn't end with the proof. So Fermat's last theorem, probably most of you know what it is, because it's perhaps the most famous uh, thing in mathematics, uh, or at least it used to be. Uh, but it, it's the following statement. Consider the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. We hear x, y, z are all positive integers. And n greater than or equal to 3 is an integer. So, um, when n equals 2, there are infinitely many solutions to this equation. But when n equals 3, there are none. And Fermat claimed this in the 1600s. And Fox said he had a really cool proof of it, but he couldn't fit it in his uh, margin. And that sort of challenge, he, he actually claimed a lot of things in uh, the book. And in the, the margin of a certain book, and every single thing was either proved or refuted, except this one statement. And um, it's sort of, uh, well, it was a huge challenge to people. And in the late 1800s, certain people made progress. In fact, some people thought they had proved it. And it turned out the proof wasn't quite right. And trying to remedy the mistake in the proof, the proof was sort of a partial proof that proved it in some cases, trying to remedy the mistake in the proof was exactly what resulted in the introduction of class groups and number field, well, class groups of number fields, which are really a, a deeper structure than you see in Galois theory. In Galois theory, you have a number field. Um, you can consider it's Galois closure. It's Galois group that tells you about um, uh, writing algebraic numbers in terms of radicals and so on, but some completely deeper structure that only uh, people learned about in the late 19th century was class groups. And that really came out of trying to prove Fermat's theorem or statement. And of course, very famous is that this is a theorem about Wiles and Taylor. Um, the Fermat's last theorem is true. And their proof uses a huge amount of, it's really a combination of algebraic number theory and representation theory. structure of the proof is, you suppose that Fermat's equation does have a solution, then you associate to that solution a, an elliptic curve, um, something like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And then using lots of representation theory and algebraic number theory, you prove that this elliptic curve um, is modular, where this is modular has a lot of different interpretations, um, none of which are easy to explain, really. But you prove that this elliptic curve is modular using a lot of representation theory and algebraic number theory. That's what Wiles and Taylor did. And then you have the fortunate fact that Ken Ribbit had proved a while earlier, which is that that curve is not modular. So it is not because that would violate a um, conjecture of Serre about the structure of Galois representations. Which, um, interestingly, this conjecture of Serre was recently proved over the last three years, and it's probably um, the main, sorry, the major result in algebraic number theory right now. So explaining at least a little bit of what it says by the end of the course will be one of the things I hope to do in the last few days when we talk about Galois representations. Do you, do you have a reference on the Serre conjecture? Um, yes. So, it's one of the big hot topics in number theory right now is something called Serre's Conjecture, which is an amazing theorem. Not quite completely all published, but, um, so, the theorem of um, Chandra Sakurakari and Walsh Smith. Oh, 
not sure who the other people are. The main person is Corey. Uh, Winton Bridget, Bridget, sorry. This guy, Dulefe. Um, so it's a term of these people. If you want to read a sort of an introduction to the conjecture, fortunately, I wrote an article of Ken Rivet called Lectures on Sarah's Conjectures. And it's about an 80 or 90 page introduction. So if you come by my office, I can give you a, a reprint of it. Or you can get it off of my web page. Interestingly, the techniques that Wiles introduced to prove uh, modularity of elliptic curves and Fermat's last theorem are somewhat related to the techniques that were used to prove Sarah's conjecture. So this is really one of the, the big things in number theory right now. It's uh, one of the things that the people around here, namely Ralph, Barney, Neil, and Trevor, don't really work on. They work on other things. But uh, definitely overall, it's really a huge, huge thing in number theory right now. All right, so we have um, eight minutes left, and I think I think what I'll do instead of talking a little more about this is, and instead of trying to rush into abelian groups, is everybody should introduce themselves for thirty seconds. So um, we have seven minutes. 20 seconds. So just, just say who you are and why you're in rest day number three. Oh, I